We are kicking off a new series today, and I am so excited about this because uh, this is a series that has been in my heart for um, probably six or nine months, and um, just really kind of wrestling through what this looks like to communicate something that is very personal to me, and I hope that by the end of this series, something that is very personal to you as well. And, uh, and we're going to talk about our church in the, in, the, in the scope of this series. We're going to talk about what is ahead for this organization. Um, but we're going to start by talking about ourselves and our own personal faith in Jesus Christ. And um, I don't know... Um, what your story is like. I've heard many of your stories. I've had the opportunity, the privilege to sit down across many of you and hear you share your story of um, how you came to faith in Jesus Christ. I've also had the privilege of sitting across from many of you who have said, you know, I'm not sure I'm there yet. I'm still asking questions. I'm still exploring. And that is just incredible. That is awesome because we have wanted to create a church from the very beginning that would be a church for everybody. It would be a church for those of us who say, you know what, years and years ago, I made a decision that I was going to follow Jesus no matter what the cost. And we also wanted to be a church for people who would say, I I want that. I kind of think that that would be good for me, but it seems like um, there's maybe a few questions that I need to have answered first, or there's a few hurdles that I have to get over first, or in fact, it just seems like maybe, maybe that might cost me, and I'm not quite sure that I'm ready to, to sacrifice what it is that it might cost me to follow Jesus, because here's the conundrum, here's the kind of the tension that we live in when it comes to faith. Okay, so we're just jumping right in here this morning. And I want you to say this out loud with me, just to kind of, so we're all on the same page here. I want you to say this out loud with me. It is this simple thing. Salvation is free. It costs me nothing. Say it with me. Salvation is free. It costs me nothing. Following Jesus will cost me something. Following Jesus will cost me something. Okay, you guys did great. One more time, just so we're all together. Salvation is free. It costs me nothing. Following Jesus will cost me something. And this is the tension in which we live, right? Matter of fact, about a year and a half ago, Andy did just this phenomenal series um, about what it looked like to actually be a follower of Jesus, what it means for us to take up our cross and to follow Jesus. And for many of us, it was a, it was a very convicting message series. It was a very convicting line of thought to think, man, to follow Jesus means that I have got to be ready to really let go of everything else in my life. And then we, we followed that series um, with a kind of a, what we call a one-off, just a one-part message. It was over Super Bowl weekend, and we did this one-off that was just kind of like, here's what it looks like to become a follower of Jesus. Like, here's what it looks like to accept this free gift of salvation. And, and someone called me uh, actually Sunday afternoon, and he was like, man, I'm, I'm really disturbed because I feel like that series that Andy did about the high cost of following Jesus was like totally opposite what we did that next week where it was like, hey, all you have to do is just, you know, pray this prayer and you're in with God. And he said, it felt like those two things were opposed to one another and they do live in tension. They live in tension because, you know, we all like this first idea. We like this first idea that salvation is free. We like the idea that heaven is a free gift. We like the idea that, that God has invited every single one of us to call him our heavenly father, that all we have to do is to pray a prayer and to say, yes, I want you to be Lord of my life. And then heaven is a free gift. So trusting Jesus with our eternity is pretty easy for most of us. And in fact, it's kind of like, well, who else are you going to trust, right? I mean, it's not like you're going to take care of it yourself, I think most of us have come to the realization that like, I don't have any control over the next life. I don't have any control over what's to come. And so I might as well trust God with it. But then this becomes a lot more difficult because this whole following Jesus thing, now that's difficult. The following Jesus thing might cost me something because I'm afraid that if I follow Jesus, I might have to to give up something. I might have to let go of something. There might be something in my life that, that's just a really hard thing for me to let go of. You know, it, it might mean that I have to make a decision related to my career that, 
I'm just not sure that I'm ready to make. It might mean that I have to make a decision related to a relationship that I'm just not sure I'm ready to make. It might mean that I have to make a decision related to uh, my finances that I'm not sure that I'm ready to make. It might mean that I have to make a decision that feels like I am going to give something up, something that to me is very personal. In fact, um, someone said to me once when we were talking about Access Church, they'd come, they'd actually visited Access a couple of times, and they had said something to me that I thought was really curious afterward. They said, yeah, I don't think that Access Church is really going to be the best fit for us because it's too personal. It's too personal. And, and I was confused by that at first because we work really hard around here to make the experience personal. Uh, we want you to know that you are known, that your kids are known and loved, that we're so excited to see you here and we're so excited to see you coming back. And so we work really hard to make the experience personal. But this person actually said, no, it feels too personal to me. Like, I just want church to be something that I can attend on Sunday morning and I can kind of check that box and, and say, okay, I did it. I went to church, you know, I... We, we, we stood up, we sat down, we recited some things, we said some things. Uh, the preacher gave a message that I didn't really understand, but that's okay because now I'm back to the rest of my life. And now I can live the rest of my life. But when I come to access, it feels like, man, this, these messages are something that I'm supposed to take with me all week long. Something that I'm supposed to think about, something that's supposed to like change the way that I live. And, I, and this person was just really honest with one of my neighbors. He said, I, I don't really want to change the way I live. I just want to go to church once in a while. But I'm pretty happy with the way the rest of my life is. And so this is this tension that we feel, that, that salvation is free and will cost me nothing, but following Jesus will cost me something. And so today I just want to look at a story from the Bible and I hope it is an example for you and for me of what it looks like for us to let go and to release something that we're holding on to that maybe is that thing that keeps us from following Jesus. And I hope I can help you understand today that when we are holding on to something, it's never, it's never, the problem is never the perceived value of what we hold in our hand. We think that that is the issue. We think the issue is that what we hold in our hand is just too valuable to give up. But the, but the issue is never the perceived value of what we hold in our hand. Instead, the issue is, do we trust him? Because here's the thing about God. He will not pry our fingers loose from this thing that we hold in our hands. He won't. He respects our free choice too much. In fact, the fact that God has given us free will is maybe one of the issues you have with God. It's one of the things that makes it difficult for you to understand. You ask questions like, why would bad things happen to good people? And there, there's a whole host of questions that come along with this reality that the God of the universe has chosen to allow you and I to have free choice. And that free choice means that sometimes we choose a path that is painful, that causes pain for ourselves. Sometimes we choose a path that is painful for someone else. And these are the results of a God that respects the fact that we have free choice. And so when we hold on to something tightly, God respects our free choice and he will not pry our fingers loose from this thing that we hold on to. But the God of the universe loves you and is for you. And it's not until we really believe that God is for us. It's not until we really believe that God wants the very best for us, that as Jesus said, that he came so that we might have life and have it more abundantly, that we're beginning or we're able or we're willing to open our hands and to let go and to release this thing that we hold on to. The salvation is free. And it will cost you nothing, but following Jesus will cost you something. And it's in that tension. It feels like, man, I, I want to be a, a Jesus follower. I want to be a Christian. I know some Christians in my life. It seems like it's been a good deal for them. But over here is this, this thing. And I feel like if I, if I follow Jesus, I'm going to have to let go or give up this thing. Someone told me one time, I know that if I, if I start to follow Jesus then I'm not going to be able to sleep with my boyfriend anymore. That's Jesus is going to say, nope, you can't sleep with your boyfriend anymore. And if I don't sleep with my boyfriend, then I'm never going to get married. 
Someone else told me, if I, if I follow Jesus, if I follow Jesus, then I'm going to have to really trust him with my kids. Like, I'm going to have to just give my kids up to him and trust him for their future. And I'm not sure I can do that. It feels like I have to hang on. I have to hold on just a little bit more. And I don't know what that is for you today, but it's not new to you. In fact, we're going to look today at a story from one of the very first people to meet Jesus very early in Jesus' ministry. And it's someone that, that is well known to you and I now, someone that is famous all across Christendom. But at the time, he wasn't famous. At the time, he was just doing his thing. He was working the family business. He was kind of going about his life, doing things his way. He had probably heard about Jesus. He'd maybe even heard Jesus preach before. And he probably even thought, you know what, this message that Jesus talks about, about the ability to have a relationship with God, that sounds like a really good message. I'm just not sure that I'm willing to let go of everything and surrender my life to Jesus. And so this, this is how Jesus kind of shows up in his life in this story. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. So here's Jesus. He's standing on the shore. And the people just begin to crowd in and crowd in ever closer as Jesus is trying to speak. And so Jesus is getting pushed back and pushed back to where he's, you know, he's standing like ankle deep in the water. And then he sees at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. So this is probably early in the day. It's probably in the morning, and um, the fishermen would fish at night. That's when the water was cooler. That's when the fish would come closer to the surface of the water. So they would fish at night. And the fact that the fishermen were washing their nets means that they had just come in from fishing, and now they're doing the business of cleaning up afterward. They've got to wash their nets. They've got to roll them all up. They've got to store their nets. And then the fishermen would go home, and they would go to sleep. They would go to bed because they had been up early or they might have been up all night long fishing. And now this was the end of their work day. And it's time for them to go home and rest. And Jesus gets into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, who we know as Peter, Simon Peter. Okay. So if you've ever heard any of the stories from the Bible and you've heard about Peter, this is that Peter. And he asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. Now, maybe at this point, Peter goes back to working on his nets. Maybe he's trying to finish up and get done for the day. Maybe Peter's standing in the crowd listening to Jesus. I don't know. Maybe he's in the boat. If you grew up with flannel graph, you've seen all different versions of where Peter was, right? Um, but when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets. For a catch. Now, this is where Jesus asks Peter to do something big. That's you and I, we don't understand the culture or the context. And so to us, this doesn't seem like a very big ask. But to Peter, this was a really big ask. To Peter, this is the equivalent of, of, of God saying to you, I, I want you to let go of that thing that you're holding on tightly. To, to, to Peter, this is the equivalent of God saying, I want you to let go of that job even though you don't know what job is next for you because that job puts you in a situation or a circumstance that's not healthy because that job has you working for a boss that likes to play in the gray too much and puts you in a place where your integrity is at risk every day. That job is working for a company that likes to play in the gray and is putting your integrity at risk. And I want you to let go of that job before you have another job to hold on to. But I want you to let go of that job and I want you to hold Hold on to me. I want you to follow me with all your heart. It's that equivalent. Because when, when, when Jesus comes to Peter and he says, Peter, I want you to put your boat back out on the water. We're going to go fishing again. Peter's like, oh, you're asking me to let go of something. You're asking me to let go of my pride. You're asking me to let go of my reputation. You're asking me to let, it, God, if I, if I, Jesus, if I get in the boat with you and we go out in the water, like, I mean, you're a carpenter, right? I mean, I don't think you really understand how the whole fishing thing works. But all these people that are standing around, this is, this is the Sea of Galilee. People understand fishing. They know how it works. I'm a professional. I can't be seen putting my boat out in the daytime and going fishing. People will think, I have no idea what I'm doing. 
People will think, I have completely lost my marbles. God, I, please don't ask me to do this. Ask me to do something else, Jesus. But don't ask me to do this. This is going to cause me risk. This is going to cause me social risk. My friends are going to make fun of me. This is going to cause me professional risk. Nobody else is going to want to fish with me or work with me. They're going to think, this guy's completely lost it. But Jesus asks him, put out in deep water. And so he answers, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Now, quick question. Do you think Jesus knew this already? Have you ever felt the need to give God more information when he asks you to do something? Like God asks you to do something and he says, hey, I want you to walk away from this position at work. And you say, God, I just got a raise. Did you know how much they're willing to pay me here? Or God asks you to to walk away from a, a certain relationship and you're like, God, have you seen her? She's cute. God's like, yes, I know. I made her. She's cute. Walk away. God asks you to walk into a situation and to take a risk, to risk yourself, to, to walk into a relationship, maybe with someone that's hurt you before, and to go back in and say, God, you know this person didn't treat me well. You know this person hurt me before. Surely you don't want me to walk back into this situation. And God says, I know, I know. I have the information. I'm asking you, would you be willing to let go and to trust me? And so Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. In other words, I'm not sure what you can really bring to the equation here, God. I'm not sure what you can really do to change the circumstances, but the circumstances, they just kind of are what they are. So we're going to pause the story right here for a minute, and I want to see if I can illustrate this. And uh, this is going to be a little bit of a risk because I'm going to illustrate this by asking a volunteer from the audience to come up here. And um, I just need one volunteer who's willing to come up and to be a part of this. I see all these hands, and I pick Kathy. She's right up front. So Kathy, come run around the side up here. And Kathy, do you have your, you have your pocketbook with you? I don't. Do you have your wallet? I don't. You don't. Look at this. This guy is giving her wallet. Great. Awesome. Bring that, bring that with you. You don't mind. And bring your phone too, Kathy. Bring your phone. Yeah, just bring it all. Oh, we're dropping phones. Okay. Come, so run on up here quickly while we're waiting for Kathy. I just will uh, tell you a little joke. No, I don't have any jokes. Um, this is Kathy. You guys welcome Kathy, please. Kathy serves on our guest experience team. We're so grateful for you, Kathy, and the ways that you greet and welcome people. So Kathy, I want to make you one promise before we start this little exercise. Okay. And that is that I promise that you will leave this stage today better off than when you got here. Okay? okay? All right. You trust me on that? I trust you. Okay. Now, the, the rules of this are that if I ask you to give something to me, you don't have to give it to me. Okay? Imagine that. But if I ask you and you give it to me, then we've exchanged ownership. Like it's not just for the purposes of this illustration. It's like for keeps. For keeps. It's for real. Okay? okay? So you understand that? Yes. All right. But I promise you'll leave better than you came. Okay. Okay. So what do you have there? What do we have? In, should we look through Marina's well, wallet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've got a driver's license here and... Um, no money. A few speeding no money. tickets yeah. there. No, no. Does he just keep all his speeding tickets tucked in his wallet like that? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, well, you know, there's no cash in here, no which cash. is definitely a sign of our times. <laughs> so um, <laughs> but, uh, wow, that makes it a little harder for my illustration here. Example, yeah, sorry. it does. Yeah. This is what happens when you don't preload. I, I would take your credit card, but I don't. So here's what I'm going to ask. Will you just give me this whole bundle, the, the credit cards, the driver's license, the phone? That's not fair. It's not yours. I know. Yes, I will. <laughs> How about this one? Is this one yours? Did you come up with anything no, that belongs to you? <laughs> that's it. That's all. I go lightly. I all right, okay. Well, lightly. all right. So while you're waving your hands around, I do notice, Kathy, you do have a delightful ring, a ring. on your finger ah, here. Yeah. 
That's got some cash value, it's right? Bad. We can go right past that. A little bit of value. I don't need your PIN number to use this. Okay. Would you be willing to give me your ring? To keep. To keep. To keep my ring. To keep. But you're not Jesus. If you were Jesus, I would give it to him. I would trust Jesus. I would give it to him. But I made you a promise when you came up here, right? Which was I'd leave better. Yes. Okay. You're going to magically make it bigger and better. <laughs> This is our tension, right? <laughs> yes, yes, I would do that. I'm that trusting of a person. So you're going to give me your ring? Right now. Right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. All it's right. for keeps. Right. If you're Jesus, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Jesus, I promise. This would be, we'd be in a whole other category of churches. You're the pastor. <laughs> you know, we got to trust all right. the pastor. All right, all right. So you've given me... This ring, okay, for keeps. Now, I have two things right now that belong to Kathy. I have this ring, and I have her undivided attention. Right? Because you have a thing of value. There. And, and this is where we confuse when we hold on to something that we think that Jesus is asking for us, and we resist giving to Jesus what we miss is that the value is not in what is in our hands. The value is that God wants our hearts. The value is that God wants our hearts. And when we release our thing and we give it to him, whatever it might be, that we have given him two things. We've given him whatever's in our hands, but we've also given him our trust. The issue is never the value of the perceived item. The issue is do we trust him? So, Kathy, I know that you've been a Christian for a while. Mm -hmm. And you've probably seen examples of this in your own life. Mm -hmm. Times when you have thought, I don't know. I don't know if I can give this up. But what was important is that when Kathy was wrestling with whether or not she was going to give me this ring, she kept coming back to you, but you're not Jesus, right? <laughs> right. Which is really, really important because the question is, when we come to the question of trust, the question is who? It's not what, it's who. Who am I surrendering this to? And when we understand that the who is trustworthy, then we can let go, and then we can surrender. And so, Kathy, even though I'm not Jesus, I want you to know that I am trustworthy. And so, I would like to give you some things for coming up on stage and being a good sport today. Awesome. I would like to give you, and you're going to want to give this back to me, but this is for you being a, this is $50 bill and this ring. Awesome. Thank you for being willing to be you're part welcome. of that. All right. No, no, I promised you would leave better. I promised you would leave better than you came, okay? And that is the promise that God makes to us as well. The promise that he makes to us is that you will leave better than you came if you're willing to surrender, if you're willing to follow, if you're willing to trust him. And so, and so, this was Peter's response to Jesus. He says, but because you say so, I will let down the nets because you say so. You see, Peter understood at that point that he was trusting a person, that he was trusting a who, that he was trusting Jesus. And so he was willing to let go of this threat to his reputation, this threat to his professionalism and say, I trust you. And so he let go because he trusted Jesus. So what happens next? Well, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. What an amazing story about fish, right? This is an amazing story about fish. In fact, if this was a story about fish, what would everyone be talking about afterward? They would all be talking about the fish. But no, 
No, instead, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. This is incredible. This is when we know that this was not a story about fish. Even these are people that they, they risked so much. You see, if they had gone out with Jesus and they had fish and they had fish and they would have come back in, if they caught nothing, they would have had to clean those nets again. They would have had to dry those nets, roll those nets. All this is happening while they were supposed to be home asleep, which means the next night they've either got to sleep then or they've got to miss going out to fish again. Like this puts their family's livelihood risk. There was a tangible risk. And and God rewards that with all of this fish, you would think that they would be talking about the fish. But no, instead, they respond with worship. Peter falls at Jesus' knees. And he sees Jesus now for who he is, not as a teacher or a prophet, but he sees Jesus as his Lord. And he worships him. And when we see Jesus for who he is, then we also see ourselves in the context of who we really are. And by seeing Jesus for who he is, Peter recognized, I am a sinner. And this is no longer about the what. It is about the who. You see, God is revealed when we surrender When we surrender, that is when we see Jesus. If you've been wondering or waiting for you to have a moment with God, if you've been waiting to have an experience with God, maybe you know some friends and they talk about God in a way that describes some kind of experience or some kind of moment and you feel like, I want to have that moment. I wonder if it'll ever happen to me. That moment happens when we surrender, when we let go, when we come before God and say, God, I don't want you. I understand I have so many details and facts I'd like to offer you, but instead I'm going to offer you this thing. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. I need you. He understood in that moment, that whole go away from you, go away from me, that's not like, Jesus, I don't like you. Jesus, I'm mad at you. That, That is, Jesus, I am not worthy because I recognize right now that you are God. And then Jesus says to Simon, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid for from now on, you will fish for people. Like, don't be afraid, Peter, because I'm about to make your life something bigger than you ever thought it could be. You thought this was just about your professional reputation as a fisherman. Peter, what I'm going to do in your life is not just going to change your life here and now. What I'm about to do in your life is going to mean that people are still talking about you 2,000 years from now. Peter, people are going to build cathedrals, and they are going to name them after you. And Peter's like, what is a cathedral? Jesus is like, don't worry about it. It comes later. But they are going to name these after you. Like, your life is about to become so much bigger. But it's only possible because you let go of your professional reputation because you let go in that moment because you let go of your worry and your fear and you said, okay, Jesus, I'm gonna trust you. And so now Jesus says, this isn't about fish anymore. I'm gonna change the trajectory of your life. You are going to become a fisher of men. So they pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything. They left everything. They left the fish. They left all the fish. And they followed him. Because it's not about fish, after all. It's not about this thing that we hold in our hands. It is about the question, do you trust me? You see, following Jesus will cost you something. Following Jesus will cost you something. The question is, What will it cost you to not follow Jesus? What will you miss out on? What would Peter have missed out on to not follow Jesus? Or as my wife says to our family all the time, you can always trust God with the consequences of your obedience. And so it is my heart as your pastor, and it has been on my heart for for years, really, as your pastor, 
to see some of us who have said, yeah, I'm good with the Jesus thing. I'm good with the salvation thing. I want to go to heaven when I die to move from that place in our relationship with God, to move to a new place of saying, I want to let go of everything. I want to surrender everything. I want to follow Jesus. I want to be a follower of Jesus, even though it's going to cost me something. I'm going to trust that Jesus is going to leave me better off than he found me. And so through this series, we're going to talk about trusting God in very personal ways. We're going to talk about surrendering our relationships. We're going to talk about surrendering our time. We're going to talk about surrendering our finances. And I know that these are things that are very, very personal. But surrendering to Jesus means that I stop asking about the relationship, the time, or the finances, and I start to recognize it's about trusting Jesus and believing him. And so I want you to, um, to watch this short video from one couple right here in our church who has taken this step of trusting God in the area of their finances, and then I'll come up and wrap us up. I'm Carla Bates. I'm Stan Bates. We have a five-year-old daughter named Caroline. We've been married for seven years. Seven years, that's <laughs> correct, yes. Yeah. And we've been attending Access Church for probably a little more than a year now. Many years before Stan and I were ever together, uh, probably about 15 years ago. I was definitely living my life as if my money and all the other money in the world that the credit card companies would give me <laughs> uh, was for my personal consumption. I've always viewed my money just as a math problem. I make this much, I spend this much, um, and it was, it was always pretty simple. So when it came to giving at church, I never, I, I never put any thought to it. I, you know, they'd pass the plate, I'd put $20 in and I always had the feeling of, you know, I'm doing something, you know, something's better than nothing. I think deep down inside, I, I got to the point where I realized that, um, you know, this is not the way that I should be living. This is not the way that I should be thinking about money. And when we got married, we decided we, need, we needed a budget. So. He decided we needed a budget. <laughs> and we started to have the conversation of, okay, what are we going to do tithe-wise? Let's have an actual thoughtful approach of this. So we decided we were going to tithe. We'd never done, we'd never, you know, I'd never faithfully, you know, tithe before, so we made a decision. We had been married for about a year. We had been giving faithfully 10% of our income. We were approached by the leadership of the church to to be consistent over the next two years in giving um, and to determine if we were able to give more than the 10% that we were giving. And so we thought about it, we prayed about it, and we did decide that we were gonna increase our contribution uh, to 14% over that two year period of time. It was a stretch. It, it was a little uncomfortable for us. So we're going through this pregnancy me being the budget guy, I'm trying to figure out how, how are we gonna make this work? She wants to take 12 weeks. We've stretched ourselves with the giving. And I went to her and I said, I mean, you know, an, an easy solution is, you know, if we pull back, you know, and just, just give the 10%, we can, we can make this work. We can, you know, the, the, the math works out, we'll have the money, you can take the 12 weeks, and you know, that's, that's a simple solution. Carla wouldn't have it. She, she wouldn't let us do it. She wouldn't let us do it. You know, it was shortly after she said, no, I mean, this is, we've made the commitment. This is what we're going to do. She gets a bonus, and I think, huh, okay. God's math is a little different than, than my math. It's not necessarily, you know, just addition and subtraction. So I often think about why God does that in the way that he does. You know, why is it that he blesses us with more than we need so that we can bless other people instead of just giving the people that have a need? giving it directly to them. Um, and I do believe that it is because that he, he wants us to have that blessing ourselves to be able to bless other people. Um, he wants what's best for us. And when we are doing what he has asked us to do with the blessings that he's given us, he gives us the opportunity to be blessed ourselves by giving away to others. It's not our money. I mean, we're being stewards of God's money. Um, so much so now when, when 
anything, when something happens, when we get a raise or we get a bonus or something happens, um, literally one of the first conversations we have is, okay, what are we doing with it? Where's this money going? Um, and it is, it, it's been pretty awesome to, I don't, I don't know how to say, I guess just kind of be a conduit of the blessings. You know, it comes in and we're able to, to send it back out and, and, and help God's community, help, um, help others just through our blessings. So grateful that they would be willing to share their story and um, you're going to hear more stories as this series goes on. And uh, candidly, we are going to talk about what it looks like for us individually to surrender our finances over the next several weeks. But I want you to know that um, this is not going to be one of those series where um, you just are going to feel beat up and beat up and beat up and the church is about my money and the church wants to get my money. I understand that finances is a very, very complicated topic. And I understand that it brings up a lot of tension. And I understand that one of the reasons that we don't like uh, the topic of money to come up at church is because we don't like the topic of money to come up anywhere. Right? I mean, it would just be so great if we never got those, you know, notifications that like you have low balance in your checking account. Anybody else get those texts? Like, oh, really? Um, so we would prefer to just kind of skate through, but we are going to talk about what it looks like for us to surrender because, because this is one of the ways that God gets our attention. This church does not want your money. Do you know why? Because Jesus does not want your money. Jesus wants your heart. We want your heart to follow Jesus. Well, we're going to talk about what could possibly happen in this community if all of us came together and said, we're willing to let go of our finances. We're willing to surrender to what Jesus might ask us to do. And we're going to talk about all the possibilities that might be in front of us in terms of a land and a building for this organization, in terms of what it looks like for us to resource organizations that we're passionate about, like the Homeless Coalition and Seamark Ranch and Sanctuary and 8th Street and, and the 6-8 Ministries in Costa Rica, all of these things that we want to be a part of. And we're going to talk about what it looks like for us to be able to do more for our kids and more for our middle school students and more for our high school students right here in St. John's County if we are willing to surrender what we're holding in our hands and to trust that God wants even more for us. So on your way in today, you got a thimble. And uh, I want you to just keep this thimble. I want you to put this somewhere that you can keep it uh, visible through the next several weeks as we talk about this series because here is what I would like this symbol to represent for you. We have used the thimble as an illustration for years here at Access Church with regard to personal discipleship. In other words, we've said, hey, we, we just feel like God wants you to invest in someone else. And many of us say, well, I don't know that I have anything to invest in someone else. I don't know that I have anything to share. I can't develop someone else as a leader. And our response has been, you know what? You may not be able to fill someone else's cup. But God has not called you to fill someone else's cup. God has called you to empty your thimble. What has God given you? What, what experiences, what knowledge, what expertise has God given you that you could pour out into the life of someone else? And we believe that that same principle is true with regard to our finances. We don't know how big of a cup that we have to fill here at Access Church. This church is growing this community is growing. The opportunities in front of us seem to get bigger every day. The needs in front of us seem to get bigger every day. We don't know how big of a cup we have to fill. But I want to invite every single one of us to empty our thimbles, to consider what it means to surrender our finances to God, to surrender our time to God, to surrender our relationships to God, what does it look like for us 
to pour out our thimble and to invest in what God is doing in this community. So that's where we're going for the next few weeks. Um, I, I promise it is, it is not a, uh, a series that is designed to beat you up and make you feel bad about money. In fact, I'm very passionate about helping you get a handle on your own personal finances because I feel like that's a really important key. And so next week, we're going to just talk about your money personality. Uh, Some of us have had fun with the Enneagram or the Myers-Briggs or many other personality profiling tests. And you look at some of those and you say, wow, that's me. That's kind of funny, hopefully, right? Or you say, oh, wow, that's my spouse. And you recognize that there are ways that we are wired with those same wirings factor into what we think and believe and what we feel about money and how we handle that. So uh, we just want to, I want to provide some very practical tools for you the next couple of weeks. We're going to talk about our money personality. We're going to talk about men and women and how we think differently about money and how that might be a factor in your relationship. Um, We're going to talk about the fact that uh, we, as an organization, we have our hopes and dreams and desires box, okay? And my goal is not to take that hopes and dreams and desires box and put that on you. That is not, some of you have felt that in church before. That's not our objective. My objective is to say together, together, we have hopes and dreams and desires for this organization and for how God can use it in our community. Together, let's take this box of hopes and dreams and desires and let's bring it before our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this opportunity to, uh, to talk about surrendering to you. I pray that this message would resonate with us regardless of what area uh, it hit home with. I'm sure for some of us it hit home in the area of relationships, for others in the area of career, for some of us in our parenting, uh, for some of us in our marriage. But God, we've, we've all got something that we need to let go of to surrender, to truly be followers of you. And I just ask that you would help us to do that. Amen.